First of all, it's unbelievable to be here. I just love it, and I think most of us do. And when you walk in, this is totally false. I mean, it's jumping with people who are looking at books and buying books and doing great things. So, uh, how did this uh, film start? There were a lot of articles and books about the depth of the book. One of my favorites was a, a, a magazine article that says, Web 2 book dropped dead. And I thought, ah, this book has been such a, a relationship with us. We love it, we hate it, we throw it at somebody we don't like. You know, it makes us happy, makes us cry. So I thought, okay, what are the five evils uh, or the four evils of the books? And, and it was going to be, you know, the, the, the mystery film about who killed the book. Well, then, you know, it was like sitting on a top of a volcano that just began erupting with all the changes. And as I went from one genre of person to another, it became so interconnected, everything we did. You know, you go to the bookseller and you end up with a publisher. You go to the publisher, you go to the digital publisher. You go to the digital publisher, you end up with um, um, a, a reader or non-reader uh, or somebody who creates an e-reader. So it all becomes so interconnected and you realize that it has changed us and every aspect of society. So uh, in this film, um, I try to, it was very important for me to show the interconnection between everything. So I'm going to show you a trailer, which is under two minutes, and the trailer it serves to show you all the things that are connected. So I find myself seated between two people. <laughs> with uh, some perspectives on books. Uh, let me give you my own. Um, I started as a, a kid coming to New York all the time and I'd come to the Strand and I could spend hours here just buying books and I went off eventually to join Amazon. Now you're trying to destroy us. To right? destroy you. <laughs> and if I can, I will set fire to this building. No, honestly, you know, I'm kidding here. No one really wants to destroy books. You know, and one of the great things I saw with Amazon, within Amazon is, as we started selling ebooks, people bought more print books. And one of the reasons that I was drawn to Kindle was it made people read more. And it helped to, well, kindle the flame of reading, if you will. I mean, we're all in this because we care about that imaginative faculty that we have as readers, as writers, when we engage with a book and some part of our mind clicks. I don't think any one of us want to see less books. And I think Jeff had a great quote. It doesn't really matter what the format is. It's about the experience of reading. And can you imagine what would happen decades later when all these books disappear, being in a sterile, empty, white room with just a Kindle on the floor? It's not going to give that same sense of sacredness. Uh, well, they're not going to disappear. <laughs> they, they will shrink. And we're, we're prepared for that. We know it's going to happen, and we're working around it. And what we're trying to do here at the Strand is make this more of a destination place, a place you can come and browse and see real books and do it that way. And so far, it's been working for us. Our sales have been up for the last two years. We had a little rough time for a while uh, after the recession and everything else, but we're, we're steadily increasing our sales. We're changing the operation. The store is a lot friendlier now than it was, and uh, we're stocking it a lot better than we did before, although we always had a great stock. And, and, so, and I agree with him. I think the Kindle and uh, other things like that have stimulated the reading part. People get involved and they look for other things, they, and it works. You know, I think the, the word looking for other things is really hugely important. Um, when you're browsing an online bookstore, you're just browsing by cover. Maybe if you click a couple times, you have this preview book function. But it doesn't beat the experience of just walking through these aisles of wonderful books and just picking one out at random and just saying, wow, maybe that'll be my destination tonight. You know, whether it's a book on Panama or um, a novel written by an author you've never had before. And you can't get that with digital yet. That's not to say in 15 years, maybe you won't be able to. 
accomplish. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, my first question, though, throughout all this, who is pushing all this? You Kindle makers? I'll tell you why, because still, for the last three, four years, the statistics remain the same, that only about 50% or less say they will ever own an ebook reader. Never say never, I understand that, but that's what they're saying. Not only that, you talk to people, these are anecdotal, but there's also statistics. What experience do you prefer, reading a book on a hard cover or, and even the young kids, I'm talking about, you know, kids who are born touching these things and reading and these things, they really, the truth is, I like it better when it's paper. So, you know, you wonder, who's pushing all this and how, how did they succeed in this whole thing? Because remember, we could, we could search table of contents for at least four dec three decades at least that I could do that. So, you know, the technology was there, but it was never exclusive. We always knew that the electronics had advantages and then the hard copy had advantages. Yeah, I mean, let me address that. You know, who is pushing the internet? Who is pushing electricity? Who is pushing cell phones? Who's pushing flush toilets? I met the enemy and it is I. Exactly. <laughs> we want that convenience, right? So something comes into our lives and we adopt it. I mean, we're, we're tool users, as Jeff Bezos said in that documentary. In that very good documentary. I like that scene a lot. And, you know, we adopt things with increasing frequency. There's a, a concept called the diffusion of innovation that was invented um, in the 50s by a physicist named Robert Adams. and you can look at the way a trend starts, and usually trends start with innovators. Then early adapters, adopters take it on. And then you get the early majority. At that point, 50% of a given population has taken on a trend. It's sort of a bell curve there, and then you start going to the late majority, and then the laggards, right? So if you look at trends, um, flush toilets took about 70 years before in America, 99% of the households had it. Television took about 40 years. And you know, with every subsequent innovation in the technology space, it happens faster and faster. I think even though maybe now 50% of the people say they have or might use an e-reader, if you look back, the most recent big innovation we've had was the internet. That hit 90 plus percent of the population in 10 years. I think 90 plus percent of the population will have e-reader devices in less than 10 years, starting back in 2007 when Kindle launched. So three or four years. Everyone's going to have them. Well, also, the statistics show that there are places where people prefer that. Of course, when you travel, instead of t filling half your suitcase with books, they love the convenience. Like he said, c we love convenience, we love whatever is easier. And uh, going, reading in bed is 50 50, either or. Um, the other reason that they might prefer the, uh, the digital is it's fast to get. You want a book, you get it, and that's all. Instant gratification. That's what we want, right? That's why we have heroin. <laughs> that we have all the pursuits and, and drugs and pleasures of civilization, and fast reading is one of them. You know, it's 60 seconds to get a book. I gotta ask you, do you have an e-book reader? No. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> you know, I Not left that. I think they're a fan of not good convenience. And, yeah. uh, it works. So how do you know that they're not great? Huh? If you don't have one or use one, how do you know they're not oh, I see things using them and I see what happens. You know? uh, but, but uh, you know, what we experienced here one time, one of our big sections was the reference section. We kept all our dictionaries, both American and foreign, and our encyclopedias flew out of the store. We don't buy encyclopedias anymore except for decorative purposes. That's how we sell them. Uh, our dictionary section has moved down to the basement because there's no reason to, to do it. You can just look it up on, the, on your telephone. Any word that comes up, any foreign word that comes up, you can do it right then and there. So I think, these, I think convenience is the real thing about this. Thing. Uh, I'm not against this whole movement. It's inevitable. It's just a matter of how do we adjust to it and what happens. 
and a couple of generations from now, everybody will be adjusting to it. Everybody is adjusted to form and things. We will keep books as a, uh, as a curiosity in 50 years, maybe 100 years. But we will definitely keep them. They'll be here. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. I can see books in the same role as um, kinematoscopes and early Victrola records. Sure. You know, they'll be collectibles to certain people. Certainly these guys will be worth a lot because there are fewer and fewer of these oh, every these, year. These are harder and harder to get for leather bindings. Yes. These are like gold coins. But this, this is decorative. A lot of it's decorative. A lot of it's very important material, too. So a lot of it's original. So uh, and that's the sort of stuff we'll be selling more and more of if we can get it. <laughs> uh, the libraries don't steal it off. Or, or, uh, it's going to happen. So I mean, I really, you know, well, I hate this guy. It's going to happen. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> you know, uh, Fred said something when we interviewed him for this film, but it ended up on the cutting room floor. He said, oh no, people will continue coming here because we'll spray our books with opium. Opium <laughs> dust. <laughs> opium. Then he said, don't use that. Don't use that. <laughs> I'll, be but, I'll be rated. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is, um, you know, you're talking about how wonderful the eater reader is. Okay, I'll go. It's wonderful. It's great. How about all that distraction? The kid, you know, the kid is reading a book and the email and the Facebook, da, 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 but pretty soon, I mean, they tell you. They tell you. So I liked your the original. Were you working on the original design? Yeah, actually, I was. Okay. Uh, I was on Kindle two years before anyone else had a Kindle in 2007. So I started like years before. It's sort of like I had a. I, I couldn't even bring it out in public. I couldn't show my parents. <laughs> um, there were secret policies at Amazon. You couldn't take it out of the building except with such certain permission. You sign a little slip so that we can track the Kindles, so that people like bloggers wouldn't take pictures of them if you had them in public. You weren't allowed to use the word Kindle in public. We had a code name. It's called Fiona. Um, we couldn't even talk about Fiona at nearby diners or restaurants outside the Kindle campus because journalists might be there listening. What if might your girlfriend was Fiona? <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually, I think there were a couple people on the Kindle team who had kids named Fiona after Kindle because we kept talking about Fiona so often. <laughs> Well, you know. well, what you're saying sounds very subversive. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of secretive? The secretive. Well, I kind of violated the rules by bringing yeah. the Kindle home. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But no, it was really nice having an early one before anyone else did. Um, in, in the Amazon sense, you know, you get to use it. You're like an early user using this so you can perfect it. So, you know, my early Kindle, as things that no one else has now, it used to have like a clip-on light that was sort of magnetically attached. That feature's gone. Um, it had different everything. It's changed a lot since then. Um, and I remember most being importantly, it was a dedicated reader. You did not succumb to the distractions. That's right. And I hate to admit it now, I do most of my reading on an iPad because I like those distractions and yet I feel like children shouldn't have those distractions, right? Like, I don't have kids, but if I did, I'd give them a Kindle happily because they would stay within the Kindle experience and not flip over to Facebook, Twitter, Angry Birds, whatnot. You can know, you I, get the old dedicated e-reader, a Kindle e-reader? Oh, you can buy a Kindle paperweight, like $69. Oh, okay. Because, remember I, that... Uh, let it be known, I don't work for Amazon anymore. I'm not pushing these things. <laughs> okay. Seriously, I, I use an iPad. I love it more than my oh. Kindle. Do you remember that after the Kindle came out, what Steve Jobs said? He Stand on the shoulder of giants. He, <laughs> he said... Um, these e-readers are useless. They're not going to make it because no one will be reading. And then two years later, he sold his own e-reader. Correct. However, uh, it doesn't look that great for reading. Um, yeah, there's um, some worries and stats. Um, I saw something that said 50% of all U.S. households never buy a book. And that's sad. Um, there are even more worries and stats about the, the households that do buy a book. Most of them will buy maybe one book a year. So the book buying population here, you guys are among the elite here in this room because you respect books and value them and you're book buyers, or you're here just to see us and mock us on stage or get wine and cheese and <laughs> whatever the perks are. But you know, it's, it, we're a dwindling population of readers in general because video games, I think, first and foremost, are competing for your mental space, your mental attention, because they engage you with your eyes and your touch and your ears, and people lose that imaginative sense 
of projecting themselves in the books, which I find sad. I agree. But a, a visual movie like your show says a lot more than a book does. It would take a lot, a lot of pages to cover what you've covered. So I think what, what you're going to lose out eventually to is visuals, media yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> so you'll be a danger to him too and me. <laughs> Well, there's a lot to be said for both sides. I think it really boils <coughs> down to the usual. Parents and teachers have always had a very difficult time raising well-rounded people, our future, and uh, it's even harder now because, um, you know, the kids tell me it's just too much work to read. I'd rather play a game, watch a movie, you know. It's but you know, what is reading? Reading isn't just the act of opening up a book and linearly turning the pages, right? I think there are people who can play a game, a video game, and get a lot out of that experience. I think there are people that can watch a movie, and myself can watch, you know, early episodes of uh, a given sitcom that I like, or a movie like Star Wars, 10,000 times, and find new nuances each time. You know, that's reading to me. I'm, I'm reading into it. Um, I don't think it bodes well for book reading, though, I agree. It is different. Um, there, there are two things that jump to mind right now. One is, you know, when you are alone, when you get older, when your kids have grown, or any, any time in your life where you find yourself alone, somehow, if you have been trained, pick up a book, sure you can turn on the TV and watch a movie, sure you can play a game, but there's an experience that you get, a certain development that you feel, a certain connection that you have that you really cannot get anywhere else the same way. Um, and the second thing, it slipped my mind, but it will come back. So. You're a romantic when you, you believe that. Should I in, a couple of gener in a couple of generations, that experience will be different. The experience will be a visual one, looking at video or something like that. You definitely know. Yes. It's here. I mean, it's happening. It is here and I it realize. is happening. And it's a faster way of learning and communicating. Well. So, and it, it's easier to learn that way. Okay. I agree. But there's something that uh, Scott Turow said that really spoke my mind, but he could speak it and I couldn't. And he said, when you turn your back to reading and writing, you're really giving up your powers in a society and the very democracy and the diversity of culture. And if you can get that another way, that depth, that understanding, that analytical thinking, not because Everybody on Facebook tells you, your friends, you should vote for that guy. Or that guy who can't even express what his policies are. You know, these are dangerous. Now, I agree with you. We have a way, humans, that we will correct. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, that we will correct things that we see are slipping. But I think for th we have a transitional couple of generations that are going to suffer. Oh, definitely. But there'll be new tools, new ways of learning, new ways. They'll develop new readers that you don't have to read with. <laughs> Alternatively, we'll make it worse for everyone. <laughs> and sink right. everyone to a state of constant uh -huh. 24 by 7 mediation. That's right. And there won't be free thought. Uh -huh. And, you know, we might want that. Yeah. Because <laughs> it keeps us happy. That's right. No, but I, I, I like... Back to the opium powder, right? Yeah, right. opium powder. I mean, that's the premise of the Matrix, right? Okay, that's, yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I like your romanticism. Yeah, I really do. And it, it touches my heart. It does. I mean, honestly. But at the same time, who is here to lament the loss of scrolls and cuneiform tablets? You know, I, I look at e-books as uh, a necessary evolution, if you will, of the form of reading. And I find when I immerse myself in a digital book, if it's a good book, I am just as immersed as I am in paper. I miss the tactile feel. I miss the beautiful leather bindings. I'm lucky I still have some in my home. I do collect old books. 
I collect sentimental books. Why don't you design the Kindle with a leather binding then? To look like a book. Yeah, <laughs> Apple does that kind of thing. They, they call it skeuomorphism. Okay. And, um, when, when you design things artificially to look like real things, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a backlash against that. As long as they read, like he said, it, regardless of format. My favorite way is the Kindle app here, because it's got all my books, and I can pick it up anywhere. And this always goes with me. Oh, you're a convert. <laughs> well, I thought you were a convert. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, at this time, we're going to be moving the discussion on to audience questions. So if anybody has a question for our panel, please feel free at this time. shrink quite a bit. But as long as interior decorators design apartments with bookshelves in them, we'll stay in business. The book. I mean the number of books that are going to have it, not the size of the book, <laughs> but the number of volumes that are going to be distributed. Uh, because there are faster ways of getting to, to people, unfortunately through the Kindle. I mean, you know, my enemy here. <laughs> Yeah, to answer the question, yeah. what was your name? It is Valerie. Uh, Valerie. I, I think there's a great piece of art on the wall over there are some distressed books. <laughs> and I'm not saying this in a mocking sense. I think there is a sense of mourning about the physicality of books. And I've been staring at that piece all night long, and I find it very evocative to me of uh, what the future of books is. It's something reminiscent. It's still tangible. It's a bit mournful. It's not a happy piece. Those look like waterlogged pages from a book, and you sense that you can't read that book anymore. I think we have this collective sense of mourning. I think some physical book objects will be transformed into art pieces as a way of capturing that. Some will end up in, you know, these hideous <laughs> um, libraries that a lot of wealthy people put up to make their houses look like 15th century palazzos to connote old style wealth. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> <laughs> as a retailer, that makes sense, yeah. Yes. But, it, it, but to me, it seems as archaic as lawns. Lawns were invention of the British aristocracy, and yet we still have lawns in many suburban American homes, just because the British had them hundreds of years ago, and that's sort of perpetuated. So I, I think we need to change our culture and mourn the physicality at the same time, and it can be a positive thing. As being negative or positive? As long as you don't use pesticides. And I live in the desert in the southwest, so I see a lot of transplants. Try to put soil and grass seeds and water them where it doesn't rain for 12 months a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's not ecologically sound in some situations, but yeah. Although at the time I asked Jeff Bezos, uh, what has he, how has he thought about recycling the Kindle? Um, and at the time he said there was no thought at all because in Europe, I believe that you can't design something without built in how you dispose of it as well. And uh, he didn't have any plans like that. And by the way, in the film, there, there were, there's a great artist who actually shows you a beautiful statue of various books that he has carved out. And in fact, for a few hundred thousand dollars, you can have one in your house. It's gorgeous. It's all made of books. You can't get that by dropping a Kindle into a bathtub. It doesn't <laughs> no. look quite that good. <laughs> I drive my iPhone in a garbage today. <laughs> Great. Uh, my name is James Pong. <clears throat> I actually work for Jason. Okay. And uh, I just want to say it's a very great privilege to sit here and stand on the first visit. My question really is not looking back through history, looking at the book form. And you've got more over there. My worry for the future is in writing. Now, as the whole world moves forward and 
you remember where books really first came from, they're all about capturing stories. Each one of these books is a story. How we speak and how we write are very different processes. And the worry I have for generation after the next, after the next, after the next, is we will lose uh, the, the like, skill of correct writing, of being able to tell proper stories going forward. So I worry less about whether it smells nice or it's used less electricity, than everything, but I worry for the future in terms of what storytelling will be from a written point of view. And that's what we've got to watch. Well, well, the Kindle will still have a written thing. Somebody's got to write for them. They have to do that. I mean, the story has to, you know, begin somewhere, and the and the written word, you know, will be typed, of course. Skill of writing. Yeah. I worry about the audience. There, a lot of people have voiced that concern. Uh, certainly, Scott Turow, and I've talked to some authors as well. Um, both unknown and known, and they said they have nightmares about it. Um, because, yes, it's true. On the one hand, any one of us can now publish. I belong to several lists, and daily, you know, you can use this software, and who's doing this marketing, and is it worth spending this money to have another company uh, market it for you? There's this, uh, so anyone can write. Is there really st a real story? Is there a good piece of writing? You know, I kind of agree with you, but I'm hoping, again, I'm putting a lot of hope on teachers of the future, not now. Everybody's in limbo now. But teachers and parents, I really hope they'll do it. You know, I see a lot of kids now, you should see, they can put together a film in seconds. Something that I would worry about for months, a scene, seconds. But I find myself constantly saying, um, that's great, I love the effects. What's the story? You know, I'm not saying that that's indicative, but we're seeing much more of that. The quality you're talking about, where's the quality? Yeah. Incidentally, just to add something to what you said before, anybody can write a book and put it together. I was out at Powell's in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, who I have a long association with. And they have one of these instant printing presses out there where you can you know, produce a book for two and a half dollars or four dollars or something like that. And I said, are you making any money on this piece of machinery? Do people come in and get their instant books out of it? He says, no, we're making money on it, but not from that. Self-publishing. People come in and get 10 copies of their book, 50 copies or 100 copies produced immediately. Just write it up, the next day you come in there, put it in the format it has to be, and the book's printed out for you. Two and a half or three dollars a copy, a nice paperback bound. Magic. So anybody can write a book and get it published now. Which I do like, actually. Sure. I, I think from a creative expression perspective, sure. there's a storyteller inside all of us. Yeah. It may be that only three or four people need to read our story, because not all of us are necessarily great storytellers. I think there are gifted storytellers with a wider audience and a spectrum in between. But to answer your question, James, in my own terms, I would say, I c in a way, I almost welcome a return to orality, if you're getting at people speaking more so than writing. Because in a way, I look at us all as people who descended from hunter-gatherers who got around a campfire and told stories during the night. And that's the root of story. That's the root of civilization in some ways. And is it wrong if Siri on our iPhones mediates that? Is it wrong if um, voice-to-text software mediates that? If we can get our words out faster and communicate thoughtfully? I think that's okay. Boy, those are a lot of ifs, but uh, <laughs> but actually, I will agree with you that uh, audiobook sales have gone up. Yep. Which is maybe indicative of people having longer commutes, <laughs> which may not be good. Yeah. <laughs> 
thank you, Ted. Uh, well, one of the things that really concern me is these wonderful algorithms. Did you work on that? Actually, I have nothing positive to say about those algorithms. <laughs> We're, hey! You know, don't tell me, don't preach to the converted. Test me, make me think. I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's so easy, you know. Oh, you really want this, or you know, you search this once and suddenly it's there. So you're, you, you're constantly getting your little question answered. But that's not about development of a democracy. The development of a democracy is when the question comes to you, not the answer that you've already had, the question that you already had. So that's one area that really concerns me. The other area, is what uh, Scott Turow said that I touched on. That is that we just don't want to read. You know, we don't want to find out even about our, 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 our um, candidates. What do they stand for? What is it that they want? We can't make our own decision. This is not strictly a book, but it's part of the same kind of technology. You know, your friends on Facebook say they all like this one, and you go, oh, all right, fine, I like them too. You know, th things along those lines. So there are many, many issues, but I just touched on a couple. I hope that answered. Is it really democracy, though? In a way, you're speaking to the richness of a culture. I guess that's how I would frame it, if I were to answer Ted's question. Because I look at these things as, if you're against these rec algorithms that recommend other books you read based on your purchases, if that's what you're objecting to, then I agree with you. Yeah. Because they promote a monoculture. And I'm for diversity of culture, right? So show me the books I wouldn't have ordinarily found. Exactly. Don't show me another Harry Potter book. Show me other neat books like that, perhaps. Don't just show me the same one that everyone else likes. But it's not necessarily democracy, which is, it's a rich culture. I still don't see the bridge to how that links to democracy. It's making you think on your own. Um, there's a wonderful guy, Mangel, um, in the film, where he says, we're all pushed to believe. First of all, he says that we dumb down our children, and especially in schools. They're all pushed to believe, this is the new genes, this is what you want. This is the new gadget, this is what you want. There's no, what they call, critical thinking, analytic thinking, and individualism, you know, which I think comes from, right. Yeah, yeah but you know, that, that, I'm sorry, that's been going on for a long time. There's an old book then called The Extraordinary Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Wow. And it's things, you know, goes back to the, the tulip phase in Holland. And, you know, that, it's nothing new. It's been going on forever and ever. Styles, fashions, everything else. It's just faster now through the internet. Much faster. It's instant. You know? Yeah, it's the diffusion of innovation again. Yeah. You know, it's, it took 20 years for the tulip bubble to play out, yeah. maybe 10 years for the South Sea bubble to play out, three or four years for the recent recession to play out with the, yeah. the finance collapse, and trends are happening faster and they collapse faster. That's right. Moon boots maybe come back in style faster, I don't know. I have a question for you, and it's, it has to do with this. A lot of kids told me they use spark notes. Do you all know what spark notes are? Okay. Now, you could say, come on, we used cliff notes. How many of you use cliff notes in college? Okay. How many of you are... How many of you don't admit to using Don't want to admit. <laughs> okay. You're honest, that I like that. That <laughs> is the difference, and that is how I'm going to address both of you. We were embarrassed when we did not read a full book and used our cliff notes. Yeah, I'll read it later. I'll, you know, this was the thinking. We were embarrassed that, gee, we're buying this just because everybody else is buying it. We were embarrassed not to have our individual voices. But now... You've got kids, he's in the film. I haven't read a book all year and I get the same grades that other children, that students get, that other students get. <laughs> Speaking of talking and writing probably. So 
I think that's the problem, that we're not embarrassed about the things we know are better for us to do. Oh my gosh, I didn't mean to have a full <laughs> silence. It's hard to argue with a tautology, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe a I agree with you completely, honestly. I mean, there's a chapter of my book, Burning the Page, where I actually go through the neurobiology of reading, and it is different. Um, the way we read is almost the way we talk. Uh, the way our brain chunks words is, when we see the word on the page, there's a part of our brain that actually sounds it out. We don't vocalize that sound, although some people do. And in fact, in the Middle Ages, everyone read to themselves vocally, and it was a rare monk who would actually read without opening and closing his lips and making sounds, and they would look upon these people as freaks. Now it's a lot different. We've sort of learned how to do that. But that part of the brain still kicks in. Information gets processed slower because of that. But because it's processed slower, we have time to actually build synaptic connections, which means knowledge. Our brains get enriched. You don't get that with TV. It's this onrush. There's no gate that throttles it and slows it down. That's not to say you can't get something out of the experience of TV or a movie, but you just need to approach it in a more critical way. And I think that criticality is lacking. It's all too easy just to consume it. In fact, I've um, talked to a few child development and brain scientists, um, and they actually did say that we, our brain was not born to read. Now, some people to, who are so happy not to read took that as a positive, but what they're really trying to say is this has been a phenomenal development for the brain and now we're retracting it and it's interesting that the question the, the the comment came from you I really appreciate it because every moment of making this film I had to ask myself are you gener is this a generational question is this uh, because you weren't born in it and what you find consistently from the smallest child to the oldest adult, it just cuts both ways. You know, it, it's not generational, it's not, basically the whole thing cuts both ways. There are some advantages, there are some disadvantages. I decided to walk away from librarianship when I saw the writing on the wall when, and, we were digitizing all the time. You know, I digitized maps at UC Berkeley because it was it was too staff intensive not to. But then students came to me and said, um, "We need help with our research paper." And I showed them all the online materials that they could use, and I showed them the print materials they could use, and they looked at each other and said, "Well." Can we just use the online material? And I said, it, it wouldn't be a complete research, you can. So they said, we'll change our research topic. And it left me thinking that they were not, they were more connected to how to search for the material than to the research topic. So I didn't want to be one of those librarians who said, yeah, the bathroom is there. <laughs> I'll happily sign a digital copy if you like. He's, he's low tech, you know. <laughs> Actually, I am a bit of an anarchist and Luddite, so I'm happy to talk to you about that. And I'll explain to you why I don't like lawns afterwards, too. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>